So by now I've been a photographer for more than a decade and I have been doing YouTube for seven years or so. And I constantly get asked about specific gear recommendations, gear that I have never ever used. So I'm making this video once and for all to answer the question, what gear should you buy as a landscape photographer? In this way, I can always refer people back to this video whenever they have a question about some kind of random Fuji lens that I've never used. What gear you should buy as a landscape photographer? So first and foremost, you need a camera and there's enough to choose from. And it doesn't matter if you're going Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, or whatever other brand. They all work, they all take the same photos, more or less, despite what some other gear fanatics will tell you. Honestly, the brand does not matter whatsoever. It can matter a little bit is in the lens selection, but for the most part, the main big brands already, even though they have changed to mirrorless, have covered what you will need as a landscape photographer. You obviously need to take your budget into consideration. What amount of money are you willing to spend on a new camera? So for those of you who do not have a big budget to spend on camera gear, definitely consider to get an APS-C sized sensor. It's a little bit smaller sensor, but most entry cameras with interchangeable lens systems have APS-C sized sensors. The alternative to an APS-C size sensor is Micro Four Thirds with a little bit smaller sensor or a full frame camera with a larger sensor. APS-C and Micro Four Thirds usually are in the same price category. However, a full frame camera does have an increased price tag of about 50 to at the very least 100% over an APS-C camera. Now, why would you choose an APS-C? over a full frame. Well, an APS-C is, as you can see, smaller and lighter, and the lenses that comes with them are smaller and lighter. However, you will compromise a little bit on the image quality. However, as a landscape photographer, for the most part, we photograph on a tripod and during times when there is light available. And for the most part, you cannot see the difference between a photo that has been taken with an APS-C sized sensor or a full frame sensor. Now a full frame camera does have many more features such as very advanced autofocus features or they can shoot many more frames a second. However, these are not really features that we as landscape photographers need. Where we can talk about the extra benefit of the full frame camera is especially during night. A bigger sensor can collect more light as a rule of thumb, and therefore you can get cleaner photos. If we compare the same generation of sensors, full frame cameras generally also have a tendency to be better weather sealed or weather resistant than APS-C sized cameras. Take that into consideration and consider what kind of weather you want to photograph in. Now this here is a Sony a7R5. It is one of the more expensive full frame cameras on the market. There are more entry level full frame cameras also with a reduced price tag compared to this one. Another benefit of many full frame cameras is that you generally have more megapixels to work with. Generally a good amount of megapixels is fine if you need to print very large, but even 24 megapixels are more than sufficient to let's say a2 and even A1 prints. And I also want to say that there is also something about an advanced point and shoot camera. They're even smaller and they have the lens built into them. I would say as a landscape photographer, make sure to get a lens with a wide focal range. So something like 24 to 200 millimeter. But generally, should you get an APS-C sized camera or a full frame camera, the main thing you need to consider is your budget and how serious you're going to be in the future with your landscape photography. However, if you are a beginner, and here we are talking one to two, maybe three years into what you're doing with photography, an APS-C size camera is probably the best unless you specifically want to photograph landscapes during night. No matter if you're using a Micro Four Thirds, APS-C or full frame camera, you may want to consider getting a so-called 
L bracket. So an L bracket is simply just an extra little iron device that you put on your camera so you very easily can change between vertical or horizontal photos. So no matter if you have the cheapest camera in the entire world or the most expensive camera in the entire world, you still need to know about composition landscape photography. So if you want to learn more about that, be sure to get my two ebooks on exactly that topic. They're super easy to read. They have plenty of examples where I show how to structure a photo in many different ways. And I cover the different compositional tools. There are links to both my ebooks down in the description of this video. So the next thing you want is a wide angle lens. Wide angle lenses comes in many forms and shapes and sizes. Wide angle lenses are generally known to be something like 16 to 35 millimeter. And this is what's called focal length or the focal range of a lens. Now wide angle lenses also come in 12 to 24 millimeter, 15 to 35 millimeter and so forth, dependent on the brand you have. You need to look into that yourself. They also come as primes and I have a few different ones here. 14 millimeter and 20 millimeter. These are good for astrophotography because they're fast lenses. You can open up the aperture a lot. However, for regular landscape photography, you do not want to use primes unless you specifically always want to photograph at the same focal length. Then you want a zoom lens. And I cannot say this enough. Generally, when you start as a landscape photographer, you want zoom lenses. You do not want primes. They can be a pain in the ass to work with because you cannot zoom with them. And you need to make this as simple and easy for yourself as possible because generally you want to climb up a mountain. For astro landscape photography, yes, the primes are fantastic because they can open up the aperture and you can let in a lot of light. And as you know, during night, there's not a whole lot of light. Therefore, we need the primes unless you go for very long exposures where you can collect a lot of light. However, that means that your stars will start trailing. So you will need a fast lens to photograph during night, either the Milky Way or the Northern Lights. And if you want to include the landscapes too, you need to go wide to include both the sky and the landscape. So generally for landscapes during night, astrophotography, you want wide angle prime lenses. Then we get into the standard range. And the reason why you also want a standard range lens is that you want to cover generally the focal range as a minimum as a landscape photographer, 16 millimeter to 200 millimeter. And if we already have a lens that covers 16 to 35, then we will need a lens in the middle that covers something like 24 to 105. So this here is my Sony 24 to 105. This lens is a fantastic lens. Canon has a new one and Nikon even has a 24 to 120 millimeter. Fantastic lenses. And obviously you need to combine these with a wide angle lens. So let's just get the wide angle lens up here to compare with. Now, the last lens you want is a telephoto zoom lens. This here is a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And obviously with that lens here, we can now cover 16 to 200 millimeter in three lenses. A 70 to 200 millimeter lens these days, however, is a bit of a compromising choice. It was the standard lens for many years for landscape photographers. However, both Canon, Nikon and Sony has now made more or less affordable 100 to 400 millimeter lenses. And if you cannot afford those, look into both Tamron and Sigma because they have also started to make some decent lenses from 100 to 400 millimeter. Now, the downside to 100 to 400 millimeter is that it is substantially larger than a 70 to 200 millimeter. And suddenly, when we remove this one, we start to have three lenses that take up a lot of space. So what you can do instead is that you can get what's called super zoom lenses. So super zoom lenses cover a larger focal range. In this case here, this is my Tamron 
28 to 200 millimeter lens, 28 to 200 millimeter. So I can remove these two here, and now I only have two lenses. Obviously, there is a downside to this, and it is reduced image quality, a little bit reduced image quality. It's actually not that bad because this Tamron lens is quite good. But if you start looking into it, and if you have a trained eye, you can definitely see the difference. Now Nikon also has a 24 to 200 millimeter lens, so a little bit wider than the Tamron here. And Canon, I'm not sure they have anything yet, but hopefully they will make something very soon to the new mirrorless system. So for those of you who use Sony, you can also get a 50 to 400 millimeter lens if you go down the Tamron road. So let's just talk a little bit about aperture. So a lot of different lenses have different apertures. And if we talk about wide angle lenses, you can generally get them in the 16 to 35 millimeter range or 15 to 35, depending on your camera brand, with an aperture of f2.8 or f4. Likewise, telephoto lenses also can come with an f2.8 constant aperture or f4 constant aperture. However, many of telephoto zoom lenses comes with a variable aperture. This means that, as an example of this Tamron here, it goes from f4, 5, 2, 6, 3, dependent on how much you zoom in with it. As landscape photographers, we generally have a tendency to stop down to something like f8, f11, or even f16 to get as much of the frame, the scene in front of us, in focus. That means that we definitely do not need a lens to shoot an f2.8. We can generally go for the lenses that start at f4. The good thing about f4 lenses is that they are generally much lighter and with these newer lenses equally as sharp as their f2.8 counterparts. So here is just the difference between the wide angle lenses from Sony f4 and f2.8. There's no doubt about which one I would prefer hiking up a mountain with. So just a few thoughts on some alternative lenses that you may think you need as landscape photographer, but probably do not. So here is an 85 millimeter f1.8 lens. So this is a fantastic lens for portrait photography. However, the combination of 85 millimeter and an aperture of f1.8 does not make any sense in landscape photography because, as I just said, you need to stop down that aperture to get more in focus. You may want to consider a macro lens. So this one here is the Lauer 90mm f2.8. Again, it is not a landscape lens, but it's a macro lens. So if you want to photograph smaller things in nature, such as fungi or small details in the grass or in your backyard, then yes, you may consider a macro lens. That said, many of the 100 to 400 millimeter lenses, and in this case here, the 50 to 400 millimeter lens, are actually generally fairly good macro lenses. They have an acceptably minimum focus distance, and because they can zoom in quite a lot, then you can actually get really close to whatever small details you want to photograph. So those are a few thoughts on lenses that you may want to consider, but you definitely do not need for landscape photography. Now, I want to also talk a little bit about the APS-C cameras, because APS-C cameras generally also do have lenses that cover that same focal range, something like 16 to 200 millimeter in full frame terms. However, it is very important that you get lenses that are specifically designed for the APS-C system that you're using. And you can, of course, upgrade those lenses. However, it is generally on full frame systems where you can get the best quality lenses. If you're looking into Micro Four Thirds systems, it's exactly the same thing. Cover the focal range from 16 to 200 millimeter as a minimum, and then go out from there, expand from there. You do not need to have lenses that have a constant aperture all the way through the zoom range. However, you do maybe want to look a little bit into the image quality of the specific lens that you're using. 
A good example where you want to look into the image quality of the specific lens is with the Sony A6000 series. They can come with this 16 to 50 millimeter lens to begin with, that is equal to about 24 to 70 in full frame terms. However, the image quality is not super good. And you can even get probably a kit where you also get something like a 50 to 200 millimeter lens, which is more or less equal to 100 to 300 millimeter in full frame terms. However, a zoom lens like that for an APS-C camera that you get in one kit is usually not super sharp. And what we all know as experienced photographers, it is more important that you upgrade the glass you put in front of the sensor first before you upgrade the camera. Even if I upgrade to a full frame camera with let's say 60 megapixels and I put a weak lens like this one here in front, I would still get a terrible photo because this lens is simply just not sharp enough so that you can benefit from those 60 megapixels. Now, no matter what telephoto lens you are getting, I would highly recommend that you make sure that you have a lens color foot for your lenses because they are quite big and heavy. And if you put them in front of the camera like this, then you start to push the weight of the front of the camera. However, if you use a foot here, a lens foot, then you make sure that you have the center of gravity right in the middle of your entire setup. It is not given that whenever you buy a lens like this, 100 to 400, that you get the lens color and shoe at the same time as you buy the lens. In the example here of the Tamron, we have to buy the Tamron foot separately which is annoying, but if you do get a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, you need to calculate that in, that you need this lens color foot because they make your entire setup so much more stable. They are almost mandatory. <laughs> so now we have talked a lot about lenses and just like you need to know about composition, you also need to know about editing. So if you struggle with landscape photography editing, be sure to enroll in my big Photoshop for landscape photographers post processing course. Here I teach you all my different editing techniques in a very easy to approach course where we start with the simple programs and then we move up through the techniques and make them harder and harder and harder. And even if you already have some experience with Lightroom, it's just fine. You can start there and then we will add a lot of that on top. There is a coupon code with a discount code down in the description of this video if you want to save a little bit of money when you enroll. Okie dokie. So the next thing you will need is a tripod. And tripods, they come in many shapes and sizes. For landscape photography, you generally want to avoid the tripods that are labeled as travel tripods. Yes, as a landscape photographer, we do travel a lot but travel photography is not the same as landscape photography. Travel photography is if you go out to a town or a city, you take photos of people, the food, the culture, you go up into the mountains and take photos of Tibetan monks or something like that. For landscape photography, you need something more sturdy. This high-speed travel tripod is a fantastic tripod if you are not standing in strong winds or along the sea. Because as much as I like a small tripod like this one here and relatively light and actually fairly sturdy, it is just not sturdy enough for what I do as a landscape photographer. If you only photograph in your local forests, walk around your house, all those things, and you are not standing in a storm in the Faroe Islands or at the ice beach in Iceland, then a travel tripod is more than sufficient. However, if you do up the game and you go travel to some more rough areas like the Faroe Islands or Iceland or America for that matter, you want to look into something that's a little bit more sturdy. Over the past years, I've been using the smallest version of the Travel Angel series, which is still bigger than a travel tripod, 
However, it has just been used and abused so much that I needed a new tripod. So I wanted to try one that's a little bit larger. And I actually really, really enjoy this one here. You can get even larger tripods. Generally, when you look into tripods, what you need to take into consideration is again, one, your budget, two, whether they are carbon fiber, because generally carbon fiber is just more sturdy and they're also lighter and your own height. If you're a tall guy, you do not want to have a low tripod, then you generally need something that is taller. So you're not standing taking photos like this each time you look down to, into it. I'm 182 and I find this tripod to be great. But definitely take your own height into consideration when you buy a tripod. And that's basically it when it comes to tripods. When it comes to ball heads, most will do fine. Like I've been using regular ball heads forever. So the next thing you want to look into is filters. Filters as a landscape photographer are really handy, but there's a lot of filters that you do not need. The only filters that I use are a polarizing filter, an ND filter that covers three stops of light, an ND filter that covers six stops of light, and an ND filter that covers 10 stops of light. That's it. And then you of course also want step up rings because you do not want to have the same filter in different sizes for all your lenses. That's a waste of money. So you want step up rings because in that way you can buy the filters that fit your largest lens. And then you can use the step up rings to put on your smaller lenses. And then you can simply just attach the larger filters onto the smaller lenses. That's how I do it. There are many different kinds of filter systems. They are square, they are round, they are screw on, they are magnetic. Over the years, I have found that screw on and then with a magnetic filter works the best for me. And there are more and more different brands on the market. I have the ones from Freewell and they come with this little case here that I've enjoyed using for the past three years. They work great and gets the job done. <laughs> the next thing is, should you get a drone? Generally, most of you who do landscape photography, I'm sure you will enjoy using a drone. I personally enjoy using a drone. But depending on what your country you're from, you need to look into all the different drone regulations because that is the worst part about having a drone. They are there for a reason, because if they're not there, people are doing all sorts of stupid shit. However, for us landscape photographers, generally we do not need a drone to fly in the national parks where there are a lot of restrictions. I use my drone a lot in Denmark and there are plenty of places where I can use it outside of what seems to be the most obvious places to use a drone, which are the national parks. I have here my new DJI Mavic 3 Pro. It has three lenses here in front, so I can have three different focal lengths to shoot at. For you, if you're just starting out, if you're considering a drone, look into the DJI Mini drones, those that are below 250 grams, because the regulations are a little bit lighter for the most part if you get those drones, and if you enjoy it, and you want to spend more time on flying drones and taking landscape photos with drones, then you can always upgrade to something with a little bit better image quality and these three different lenses. But this year is becoming quite an expensive line of drones, the Mavic drones here. So right now, this year is my personal landscape photography kit. My main camera, the Sony a7R5, the Sony 16 to 35 millimeter as a wide angle lens, and the 50 to 400 millimeter from Tamron as my telephoto and standard lens. In this way, I have two lenses where I can cover 16 to 400 millimeter. It's very practical and that's what I prefer. Then I have my drone and I have my filter system and this somewhat light tripod, but still fairly sturdy. Now, if I go out and do landscape photography during night, I do not bring these two lenses here or my drone or my filters. I simply just bring my camera and my two night lenses and my old camera, which is my backup camera, the Sony a7R 
three. And in that way, I have two cameras with two different lenses on that are really great for night photography. Now, I cannot tell you whether you should get a 14 millimeter prime 2.8 lens for your Micro Four Thirds Fujifilm camera setup. Hopefully, you can make that decision yourself now that you have seen this video. The answer is no, you shouldn't. Get a zoom lens. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I hope I saved you some money also for that matter. And I hope I answered some of your questions. If you want to learn more about landscape photography, be sure to check out the links down in the description of the video. See you next time.